Hey guys, wanted to do a quick update on malignant hyperthermia and its pathos. So let's jump into normal muscular contraction and see what it looks like. So we have a depolarization of the muscle that goes to stimulate um, this DHP in a RYR1 receptor. These are just kind of basically two receptors that touch one another, um, basically at the at the border of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the the rest of the the, the internal of the muscle cells itself. So what happens is that those two and specifically the RYR1 receptor controls outflow of, of calcium, which is the overall problem in, uh, in malignant hyperthermia. But normally that a little bit of calcium is pushed out into the, into the tissue, the, into the cell, and then actin, myosin bind, ATP metabolizes. We have heat, water, CO2, and energy, the ATP. And then once that's broken with calcium, actin, and myosin, heat is also, more heat's also created from that, that reaction. So then, of course, muscles contract. And then this thing called the uh, calcium ATP ACE receptor, or um, uh, basically an intracellular globulin, basically pulls calcium back into the cells, stabilizing everything. That is normal. Now let's look at it, what it looks like when we don't have, when we have abnormal function. The problem here with malignant hyperthermia is we have a mutated DHP and or RYR1 receptors, and specifically with that RYR1. And all it does is basically it doesn't control the amount of output calcium. So a bunch of calcium is now all of a sudden out in the cell. If calcium's out there, then it's going to get utilized uh, with actin and myosin. So normally when just a tiny bit goes goes through, uh, then uh, you have a muscular contraction that you that you need for a short amount of time. If there's a if there's a whole bunch of calcium out there, then they just line up and they get in, in line and they when, when it's their turn, they bind actin and myosin. So we have this prolonged muscular contraction, this prolonged heat production because ATP is needed for each one of those reactions with actin and myosin. So we have increased heat, increased CO2 production. What happens is if there's not enough oxygen and sugar to continue to metabolize to give an ATP to get that calcium and myosin uh, and actin to bind, then it gets hypoxic. The cell gets hypoxic. It goes through acidosis, like we're all aware, that causes cell walls to rupture. And what can happen after that? Hyperkalemia, as that potassium spills off into the cells. And so rapid and hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia are the things that happen way, way, way downstream. Let's look and see how we kind of mitigate it. Now, should you still use succinylcholine? For whatever reason, the make sure you're monitored for two things. Really, one malignant hyperthermia. The other, you're looking for that hyperkalemia. And the for malign, or mass for malignant hyperthermia, you're looking for masseter muscle spasms. So your mouth will close like a Venus flytrap. You're looking for increase in temperature spikes like 104, 105, 106. Uh, you're also looking for entitled CO2 increase, so in like the upper 70s, 80s, 90s, even triple digits. The manager of that is dantrolene. Now, we'll cover that in another video, but the uh, hyperkalemia issue is um, you'll see the T waves enlarge. They'll start to get real pointy, and then they'll get wider, and that's if you haven't started treating it by then, you need to treat it at that point. Um, calcium, bicarb, insulin, glucose, and albuterol is what you need to, to help correct that, maybe even Kexalate. I love Kexalate back in this case, but uh, down the rabbit hole, I don't think I have it on the screen, but I will. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that. Now, so a quick thing about this, um, it, when, you, when you drill down to it, there's a handful of things. You know, MH is, is tough to manage. Uh, hyperkalemia can happen because of MH or just inherently from uh, the, somebody having a neuromuscular problem or or anything where they don't move their muscles very often. Um, now that said, when it comes down to it, you know the dantrolene in MH, what that does is it slows down the RHR1 receptor. It slows down it like releasing uh, calcium out into the the um, cytoplasm of the cell. So when it when it does that, there's less calcium that's in line, ready to create heat and uh, energy and CO2 and that thing. So that's how dantrolene works in MH. Um, when we get to, you know, hyperkalemia, treat hyperkalemia, when you get to uh, malignant hyperthermia, if you have dantrolene, great, but you're probably not going to have it. So the whole point is try to think of a situation where you don't have to give dantrolene. Right, so if you if you're given socks, if it's for a pediatric, maybe don't do it because they might have undiagnosed or muscular problem. If you're gonna, uh, uh, you know, give uh, suction hold for other reasons, make sure that they, they don't have a predisposition or family history of it. 
there's a lot of anesthesiologists that use succinylcholine on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a safe drug overall. In pre-hospital, my whole thing is, we don't. there might be times where it bites us in the butt more than it saves us. So for those of you who think, hey, we should never do it, like I'm on that side of the, but I'm also like, hey, there's a, a handful of occasions where we maybe it's okay we do it. That said, make sure you look it up, make sure you study it, make sure you figure it out. Uh, don't just use me and, and the people who trust me uh, about it. Look it up for yourself. Make sure you do the right medicine for your medical director, your uh, protocols. Take care, stay salty, and we'll see you next time.